Hello, it's Mike Pollitt again, captain of XM655, and today we're going to give you a cockpit tour. This is the autopilot at the back, the black box. It's uh, a very early autopilot, and it can either hold the speed or it can hold the height. It can't do both at the same time. I had a good experience going across the pond uh, once when I was uh, what they call thumb in bum and mind in neutral and we'd lost a thousand feet and I hadn't realised it so you've got to keep an eye on the autopilot. Forward of the autopilot these are the Bombay tank uh, which can be fitted. You can get three tanks in the Bombay to give you an additional range obviously and forward of the Bombay tank controls are the main fuel panel the switches um, are for the booster pumps within each tank and uh, as she's got four engines you can see that the number one engine is outlined in orange so the one the one tank number four tank number five and number seven are for number one engine and that's known as one group number two number three and number six are number two engine or number two group and so it goes on two three and six sorry six on the starboard side that's number three engine and i won't bore you by talking about number four group because it's obvious the whole trim of the aircraft is controlled by the sequence timers these four electro clockwork um, sequence timers and in the period of six minutes they will decide which pumps are going to go to full power the remainder will be on half power and in that way they maintain the balance or trim of the aircraft as it's known port and starboard and um, front and up and back and you can check that on this instrument which when the as you can see it moved then so we're still in the green sector she was almost perfectly trimmed on the starboard side and slightly tail heavy on the uh, port side but the sequence timers if you let them do the business, it's fully automatic. These are the fuel gauges. Again, one, two, three, and number four engine for the four groups. They show the content of the whole groups that we've already talked about. And if you want to know the content of an individual tank within one group, you'd press the button by the side of the booster pump switch and the gauge then indicates the contents of that particular tank as opposed to the group. These are the engine instruments in the center between the two pilots. Along the top we have the jet pipe temperature. She normally sits at 350 degrees when she's uh, just started and in cruise. So you'll note that's in the 12 o'clock position. So it's very easy as you glance across the JPTs to see if one's misbehaving and you perhaps have a hot gas problem. RPM, not like a car, this is in terms of percentage. She idles at 24 and a half um, RPM. And as you increase towards 100%, that is full power. It is not a linear increase in power. In other words, um, at 60%, you are not getting 60% of her, her power. Although 68% is a very good RPM to remember. It will hold any speed with 68% set. As you go through 80%, things become interesting. The power is now really increasing. The brakes will not hold any more than 80% on the ground. So for takeoff, you check the engine instruments at 80%, release the brakes, apply full power, and you go off like a homesick angel. Up here, we have the accelerometer. Uh, the huge wing develops a lot of lift the maximum G below 160,000 pounds is two. And normally we don't pull any more than 1.8 G. Uh, and you can out turn any Soviet fighter or any fighter of, you know, we had during the period. I should think um, it would give a hunter, for example, a damn good dogfight. Certainly, I don't think it was before the typhoon arrived that the RAF had anything that which would outmaneuver this. Engine instruments now. In front of me, we have a radol. You'll note it only is effective below 500 feet. The Mach meter 
is here. Mach 1 is the speed of sound. You'll see the limit on the Vulcan is 0.96. What happens is as you increase speed, the uh, center of pressure or the center of lift vector moves back. And eventually that is going to get behind the C of G. Now, this isn't a problem, but as you do move the center of pressure back aft of the C of G, you get a nose down pitch. You correct that by applying up stick and then just trimming out any of the forces. However, at 0.96, we run out of upstick. <laughs> so uh, any faster than that, and people have done it, um, particularly in uh, combat against fighters, uh, you uh, are out of control. And you simply wait until you get down into the denser air, around in the 20,000 uh, feet altitude wise, and the Mach uh, number will come back down below 0.96 and you gain control again. ASI, airspeed indicator in knots. This is what's known as the military firing system. It's a combination of the attitude indicator and that's a standard looking one and so that gives you your position when you're in cloud uh, and you know you're upright or you know how many degrees angle of bank you are applying. It's also the instrument landing system superimposed on this and very important for low level, particularly at night, the terrain following radar feeds into this yellow horizontal bar, which is going to be very difficult to pick up, but you've got one there on that instrument in front of the co-pilot. So that is a complex uh, system and probably an hour's presentation in its own right. This is the VSI, the vertical speed indicator, both in terms of up, where when we're starting the climb, we're off the clock and coming down, if you flew a trainer like the Jet Provost or the Tucano in spins, this would be off the clock in the down sector. Over here, standard pressure altimeter. Obviously, it's uh, showing standby at the moment because we haven't got the uh, frequency changes on. Here is the standard compass, um, which uh, is like any other aircraft compass. This is the distance to go to the target. This is a replica. Uh, it won't work at the moment. Here, parking brake, um, pull the lever back and locker in position. Also acts as another standby braking system or an alternative braking system. It will apply, once it's in the on position, full braking pressure to the brakes themselves. Down on this side, in the front, I've got my oxygen regulator here. Uh, we always uh, put the oxygen on, even though you didn't require it on the surface. It's air mix until about, I think it's in the 20s that it changes to 100% oxygen. And when you got above 33,000 feet, if you didn't have the pressurization on, you got pressure breathing into the mast. Difficult to get used to. You actually have to force the air out and let the air in. It's uh, the kind of opposite to standing around uh, outside normally. These are the controls for the bomb door. But that is the normal control. So you're using hydraulic pressure from the engine. It's the free hydraulic pumps. This is the electrical system will and the electric hydraulic power pack. Now that's the control for that. And that again will open the bomb doors. This is the abort and jettison button there. So I'll hastily put the covers back on that as the bomb doors are open. The uh, orange lights over here, this is the powered flying control control panel. And this is showing that all the um, PFCs, the powered flying control units are off. So these lights, if you started them, would go off. And the three start buttons are right back here on my left hand side. This is the control for the terrain following radar. And uh, that is the standard box uh, for intercom talking on conference, which is you can select and just talk to the co-pilot or a student pilot if he was in here and the rest of the guys wouldn't be interrupted. And it selects RT1 and RT2 for listening to. Um, this is RT1 back here. 
Um, sorry, this is RT2, I beg your pardon. RT1 is in the back under the control of the AEO. And right at the back is the start panel. Um, you can either start individually uh, or you can do a rapid start uh, starting all four together. And you can start them with the rapid system individually as well. That's the uh, left hand side. On the right hand side, the co pilot's instrumentation is very similar. There are a few differences. He has the fuel flow meter, which is important on engine start. As soon as you note that the oil pressure is beginning to read, it means that the engine is beginning to rotate. And as soon as you've got rotation confirmed, you then open the HP cox and the throttle to get eight to 10 pounds a minute on that flow meter. And as soon as she lights up, you're looking for 7% RPM, very low, because that is the hint that you can put the throttle into the ground idle position. You don't want to do that too quickly and increase the fuel flow too much, as just like a car, she'll choke. Yeah, and you'll get a, a boom, 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 boom noise coming out of the engine a lot louder than that. Down the right hand side, we start off with your intercom box, which is the same as my side, his oxygen regulator, and then you're into the various air selector switches. These are the engine air switches, which if we're using a Palouse to start the engines, you would open those engine air switches in the order that you wish to start. Four, three, two, one, when we're starting normally, is the order we use. Behind that are the air-to-air -air refueling um, controls, and right at the back on the right-hand side down there, you've got the airframe anti-icing and the engine anti-icing controls. If we start here, this is the pressurization switch. She's in cruise at the moment. If I brought her back one, she'd go to cabin. These are the engineers used to let the pollution air in when we're doing normal starts. Four, three, two, one. This is the cabin air. They're on at the moment, ready to pressurize the aircraft when she goes above about uh, 8,000 to 10,000 feet. These are the pito head heaters. They let air into the instrumentation, basically, uh, but they, the, the, the static uh, pito vents are heated. This is the external light master switch. Uh, that's the downward ident light. These operate the taxi and landing lights, which is a combination. Two, uh, one on either side, uh, two positions, landing and taxi. This is the navigation lights and the anti-collision lights uh, operated from the same switch. This is air-to-air -air refueling here. Um, this is cockpit temperature control. So the co-pilot is a very popular man because the guys in the back always want it a bit warmer. And as you've just said, it's always warmer up in the pilot seat. So he sets this to about the 11 o'clock position and takes all the flak from the rear crew. Here we have the anti-icing, basically airframe anti-icing, engine anti-icing. And uh, right at the back, just in front of the um, soup can heater, as I call it, I think it's called the food heater, there is the AVS master switch. Um, AVS is the air ventilated soup. Very good at warming you up, bloody stupid at trying to cool you. <laughs> But oh, Martin Baker, Mark 3A bang seat. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What about the, uh, what does the abandoned aircraft switch do? Oh, right, the abandoned aircraft switch is here. It brings on the red light in the rear crew, in front of the rear crew, and it says uh, abandoned aircraft. We don't joke with that whatsoever. So in the event that we lost intercom, you'd operate the abandoned aircraft switches and they would literally bail out before either pilot ejected. These, and this is interesting because we were talking about the PFCUs, the powered flying control units, and these uh, operate the ver uh, control surfaces at the uh, trailing edge of the wing. They are big, and this reflects the position of the eight control surfaces. So at the moment, we're in the neutral or trailing position, as it's known. 
And if I were to apply full up stick and there was power there, you'd see these all go up. And conversely, if I was to push the stick forward, you'd see them go down. As well as at the top is the position of the rudder, which at the moment is straight. Uh, in other words, uh, we haven't applied any yaw to the aircraft. The other application of the rudder is the nose wheel steering. And that again is controlled by the rudder pedals, but you initiate it with this button here. This is the aerodynamic trim. It just operates small control surfaces on those actual control surfaces, and it takes out any aerodynamic load. Because there is no physical connection between the stick and those control surfaces, we induce artificial feel by various oversprings and leverage within the bomb bay. If anything goes wrong, this is the ultimate feel relief button. That is pressed to transmit to talk to air traffic. That's it. You've got it. Very complex. Done the course, done the course now.